Hello and welcome back. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and a New Year's and we're going to be hopping right back into AI code this year and we're going to be implementing some simple ragdoll and some death handling for our little crawly boys here and get them to dissolve the ragdolls afterwards after a couple seconds random delay. So jumping right over into the project, there's a couple changes I want to go over before we get into code, starting with the changes I made to the body and eye shaders over here. We were doing a standard material, but we went ahead and broke that out to a custom shader, and the custom shader pretty much does just a mimicry of the standard material with one minor exception, and that's the alpha channel. So all I'm really doing is taking the vertex in local space by multiplying it by the inverse view matrix and then taking the node world position and subtracting that from it to get a local relative space to the node's origin and then I'm using that as the UVs for a dissolve texture that's just a 3D noise texture and you can find that right here. I just went ahead with a 64 by 64 by 64 as I didn't want it to be too high on performance cost and ultimately it doesn't really matter if it's a very low resolution as it'll still get the job done. Now I'm sampling between this using a smooth step and I'm using the dissolve weight with a range between negative 0.1 and positive 1.1 and then I'm subtracting and adding from it to get the top and bottom edges and that just kind of blends between those based off of how much I'm subtracting and adding. The reason why we went with negative 0.1 and positive 1.1 is just so that we can actually get to absolute zero and absolute positive, even with the blending. So if I go down here, I have that under the instance shader parameters, and if we fade that up, you can see the AI just dissolves all the way away. And we're gonna be using the same shader on the ragdoll, though we did end up going with a slightly different configuration. This mesh itself won't be the exact mesh that dissolves, it will be the ragdoll, but I'm still using the same mess shaders just so that everything looks right. Now, besides that, I went ahead and did pretty much the exact same thing on the eyes. The only real difference being that instead of fading away in any sort of complex manner with the noise, I just use the Fresnel around the edge that darkens it to fade away at that side. So you can see right here, they just kind of fade away in the center. And that's pretty much all we're going to need there. Now, besides that, I did go ahead and create a couple other things that are going to be used. First off, we have a particle system. This one's very similar to the temple particle system. I just kind of condensed it down into a single point, and we're going to spawn a couple of these and adhere them to the ragdoll as it dies so that that way the arms and legs and the body will all dissolve kind of independently. It'll look like a convincing effect. Once you see it in action, you'll definitely see what I'm talking about. Speaking of which, we went ahead and also created a ragdoll. Now, the ragdoll is created from the mesh exactly like the cultist body. The only reason I separated it out is because there's kind of two ways to do ragdolls. One is ragdoll in place where the mesh that is animated is also the mesh that turns into a ragdoll. And that for my purposes was a little bit too complex to pull off and get looking convincing. So what I ended up doing was just going ahead and making a ragdoll and I reposition all the bones to where the cultist prefab's body's bones are at the time of death. And then I apply force to it in the direction that the body is moving. And you'll see all that once we get into code but you can see the ragdoll here and with the with all of the joints besides the origin joint which is the spine 003 for me i went ahead and set them all to six degrees of freedom joints as opposed to pin joints which is what they default to this lets me actually put constraints on the joints so if we hide everything and you see this bone right here we've got a couple of axes limited here for example we have the left and right tilting and if we control these values right here for the angular limit upper and lower on the y-axis we can see that tilt constraint kind of in action and what i ended up setting all of these was kind of on a case-by-case -case basis and it's going to change based off of your rig and your mesh and your purposes so this one's set up so that it kind of stretches either way like this but it doesn't bend too far backwards and it also doesn't rotate any as i just found that that resulted in undesirable results so this is kind of how i set up and I just stepped through all of the bones and set them up. Something to be aware of is when you have two bones that are on the opposite sides of the body, sometimes they are the exact same axes. So if you subtract from the y-axis upper, for example, they'll both go the same direction and sometimes they'll be inverted. So something to be aware of, be careful when doing multiple at the same time or else you might get undesirable results. And that's pretty much it for the ragdoll and the particles. I'm going to go ahead and hop directly into code. And first off, we're going to be starting with the cultist AI controller. And then we're going to make a script to actually go on the ragdoll to make it dissolve once it has spawned. All right, and hopping right in here into the AI controller, we're going to add in a new category for health settings. 
and we're going to immediately add two float variables for the max health and the damage per shot. Under more complex game circumstances, I would probably want the damage per shot to be tied to the gun so that that way we could have multiple guns with different values for each. But for the time being, we're just going to have this reside on the AI controller for ease of access. And then we also have a max health, which is what the current health will be defaulted to on ready. Besides that, we're going to need two references to the in-game body. One is going to be the roller ball, and that's just going to be this rigid body right here that controls the movement. And then the other one is going to be the base skeleton, and that's going to be the skeleton 3D that actually controls the animation. We're going to be using this to impart the velocity to the ragdoll, as well as imparting all of the bone origin positions at startup to the ragdoll before it actually begins the simulation. Just below this, we're going to go ahead and add in our prefab for our ragdoll scene. And below all of those, as not an export, but just a public variable, we're going to create a current health float. We're going to set the setter to private so that that way no one else can modify it, but maybe other scripts will need to be able to see that in the future. And we're going to immediately throw in a ready function that's just going to set the current health to the max health. We're also going to create an on damage function, and this is going to be called from the signal from the damageable object that's attached to all the AI. And that signal passes a hit location, a force, as well as an aggressor body node. And so we're going to put in those parameters right up here. And we're going to immediately set our current target to the aggressor body node. So if the AI doesn't die immediately and you do shoot it, we want it to go ahead and aggro to the player. Then we're also going to set our current health minus equals to the damage per shot. And if our current health is less than or equal to zero, we go ahead and call the on death function, which doesn't exist so let's go ahead and create that next and this function is going to be where most of our work goes it's going to add in a ragdoll as well as go ahead and set all of its bone locations and set its current velocity to whatever the velocity of the body is and then factor in the actual hit location and force to kind of whip the body around based off of where you shot it so let's go ahead and create a new ragdoll, which we're just going to be using the ragdoll scene.instantiate as node 3D. And we're going to go ahead and add that ragdoll to our parent, which is typically just going to be the scene root node. But we go ahead and add it to our parent so that that way, if we happen to put in all of our AI into like a container node or something, we want to make sure that this ragdoll is also in that same container. Now we do need to go ahead and get our ragdoll skeleton. And because the ragdoll skeleton might be varied from ragdoll to ragdoll, we're going to go ahead and create a new function that's just going to find the first skeleton 3D in any hierarchy that we spawn. We're going to go ahead and create that function down below the on death function, and it's going to take a current node and it's going to return a skeleton 3D. Now, this is going to be a recursive loop. So what this function is going to do is check to see if the current node is a skeleton 3D, in which case it's just going to return it. And if it's not, it's going to call this same function on all of that node's children. So first, we're going to check to see if current node is skeleton 3D, and if so, we're just going to return that skeleton. And if that's not the case, we're going to go ahead and go through all of the node's children, and we're going to call the retrieve skeleton function on them. And if it returns a non-null value, we'll go ahead and return that value. And finally, if it, if it doesn't return a non-null value on any of its children and it itself is not a skeleton, we go ahead and return a null on that one. So the end result is that the found skeleton should return the first skeleton it finds, and if it doesn't find any, it will return null. So if it doesn't find anything and it returns null, we are going to want to go ahead and error out. So we're going to go ahead and print an error saying we could not find the skeleton 3D in the ragdoll scene, and we're just going to return. That should never happen, but it's good to have functions like this in place. Now, first up, after that, we're going to go ahead and set our ragdoll's global position and rotation, as well as our skeleton's global position and rotation, just because they may not be in the exact same location. And we're going to go ahead and iterate through all of the bones of our skeleton and set the bone pose position based off the base skeleton's get bone pose position. And we're going to be doing this based off the index because all skeletons are indexed just zero to whatever the number of the bones are. And this will always work so long as the two skeletons are identical. So if you are doing this with your own skeleton, your own rig, make sure that the skeleton that you're spawning is the exact same as the skeleton that you are basing it off of. And that's just going to put all of our bones into the correct location. So we can go ahead and call the start simulation function on the found skeleton. And that will initialize our ragdoll. Now, we do need to go ahead and find the bone that's closest to the hit location so we can apply that force. And we're also going to want to apply to all of the physical bones in the simulation the force of the rollerball. So let's go ahead and get started on that. So we're going to declare two variables here. One is going to be the closest bone found as well as the closest distance. And we're going to default the closest distance to mathf.infinity. So whatever value you put in this it will always be less than what it starts as so that way we'll get the first bone right here and then we'll step through all of the bones and find whichever one happens to be the shortest distance from the hit location so for each of the found skeletons get children we're going to go ahead and check to see if that child is a physical bone 3d and if it is we're going to go ahead and apply the impulse for the rollerball's linear velocity and that's going to go ahead and move all of the bones in the direction the ai is currently moving the benefit to us using physics to move the ai means that we can go ahead and move all 
all of the bones smoothly without having to calculate any sort of estimate of what the velocity was or anything like that. Then we're going to check to see if the distance between the hit location and the physical bone's global position is less than the current closest distance. And remember on the first one, this will always be true, but on every one after this, it'll just find whichever one is closest. And if it is closer, we're going to go ahead and set our closest distance to this distance and our closest bone to this bone. Following all of this, we're just going to check to see if the closest bone does not equal null, which just prevents any errors from occurring here if the skeleton's improperly set up or something. And then we're going to apply the impulse based off of the hit location of the actual shot that killed it, as well as the force. So that this way, if we shoot it down near the leg or something and it finds that the bone closest to it is the foot, it'll go ahead and whip the entire body around based off of that location. And finally, we go ahead and cue free, and this will handle everything for the enemy AI in order to kill it when it loses all of its health. So let's go ahead and test that in practice. If we go over to the cultist, we can go ahead and set our rollerball to the rollerball rigid body. Let's set our max health to one just to make it simple to test. We'll set our skeleton 3D and go ahead and also load the cultist ragdoll prefab that I already created. We should be able to go ahead and save, and this should make it so that whenever we shoot them, they just turn into a ragdoll. So let's go ahead and hit play and see how that looks. All right, and we can see we got a whole bunch of cultists chasing us. If we go ahead and shoot them, they are not dying. All right, let's go ahead and find out why. We don't currently have any errors. Let's go ahead and check our level one scene and see if anything got overwritten. Yeah, on each of our cultists, this happens a lot in the scene. So let's go ahead and delete all of our cultists and we'll just test this with one. We'll undo all of the changes that happened because of the scene. We'll go ahead and set our current target, save that. And let's try that out for size. All right, so we have our AI and when we shoot them, he goes ahead and goes down in kind of an awkward location, but still. And later on, we may very well want to go ahead and make the ragdoll respect the bullets that are shooting it while it's on the ground. But for the time being, I just have it ignoring that layer and we'll test that in the future. But these things are going to dissolve so fast, you probably won't even notice anyways. And it's just better for performance for the actual raycast to not be worrying about ragdolls. So now that we're out of that, we can go ahead and handle the ragdoll dissolving. So let's go ahead and create a new script in the enemies folder. This script is going to be called Cultist Corpse Dissolve, and we're going to be inheriting from Node 3D. Let's go ahead and move these all down. We're going to create a couple exports. We're going to have first off the max random delay. That's the amount of time we randomly will select between zero and this to delay before we actually start the dissolve. We want this to be a fairly low number. And then the dissolve duration will be how long it takes to actually properly dissolve out. And we're going to set this up to a little bit higher number so that we can actually see the effect in play. In addition to this, we're going to need an array of all the meshes which have that shader instance variable on it. In our case, this is just going to be the cultist mesh and the cultist eyes mesh. But later on or with your project, you may have multiple different gear items or something like that that all need to dissolve. And in which case, you'll need to add these all to the array. Right below that, we'll go ahead and add our pack scene, which is going to be our prefab for the dissolved particles, which will occur when the AI begins to actually dissolve. And we're going to need an array of node 3Ds for the dissolve points for those particles. And these are going to be the upper arms on either side and the thighs on either side, as well as the torso for me. We're going to create a couple of private variables. One's going to be the fade delay, and this is going to be counting down uh, from start until we begin the actual dissolving effect. And then the other is going to be the fade current, and that's going to be counting up once we've started to dissolve from zero to one. And we'll go ahead and create a Boolean for spawn particles, and this will just be the changeover to make sure we only spawn the particles once. We'll be checking that, and then when we begin to fade, we'll set that to true and go ahead and spawn the particles so we don't spawn them multiple times. And speaking of which, we'll go ahead and create a new list We'll need to use the systems collections generic. And then the spawn particles cache is just going to be all of the particles that we've already spawned so that when the AI's body actually properly is destroyed, we can go ahead and unparent those so that that way they don't delete with the body when they haven't properly finished animating. So first off in the ready function, let's create a new random number generator and we're going to get a random value between zero and the max random delay. And we're going to set the fade delay to that value. Now over here in the process function, we're just going to go ahead and check to see if that fade delay is greater than zero. And if so, we're just going to subtract from it delta. If that's not the case, then the first thing we're going to do is check to see if we have spawned the particles. And if we haven't, then for every spawn particle point, we're going to go ahead and run a loop to spawn those particles. We're also going to set the spawn particles boolean to true. So inside that loop, let's go ahead and spawn our particles prefab. We're going to call the dissolved particles to instantiate as GPU particles 3D, and we're going to cache that as just particles. We're going to add that as a child to our point. So this will be the arm or the leg or whatever is dissolving. We're going to set our global position and rotation to whatever the point's global position and rotation is, just to make sure that there's no inconsistencies. And we're going to go ahead and set emitting to true and call the restart function. This is going to go ahead and get all the particles started. 
Now we do need to go ahead and add it to our cache and we are also going to set a timer and this timer is just going to be the lifetime multiplied by two divided by the speed scale. This will make sure that no matter what the particles are completely done before they go ahead and are deleted. And to affect that timer, we're going to use the get tree dot create timer. This is going to return a scene tree timer Then we're going to tie into the timeout signal of that timer. And we're just going to add to it the particles dot Q free function. And that's going to be pretty much it for our particles. Now we do need to go ahead and handle the dissolving itself. So we're going to add to the fade current our delta divided by the dissolved duration. So this will slowly fade from zero to one over the course of about three seconds. And then we're going to use the mathf.remap function in order to map it to the value of negative 0.1 to positive 1.1, which is what the actual instance shader variable requires. And the remap function just takes in a value and takes in what its theoretical lower and upper limits should be, and then remaps it to the new lower and upper limits. So zero in our case will be negative 0.1 and one in our case will be positive 1.1 and then everything in between. We're going to create a real simple for each loop that's just going to go through all the dissolved meshes. That's going to set the instance shader parameter for each one that's called the dissolve weight parameter. And then we're going to set that to the current map fade. In the future, you may actually want to break this out to a string so that that way you can use it on multiple different projects and multiple different characters with different shader parameter names. But for our purposes, this will work just fine. Now, just below that, we are going to go ahead and check to see if the current fade count is greater than or equal to 1.0. And if so, we're going to go ahead and queue free. And just before we queue free, we are going to go ahead and go through all of our spawn particles caches. And if their instance is valid, that means the timer hasn't actually gone up, then we're going to remove them from their current parent. So the arm or the leg or what have you, and add them to the parent of this node. So that should be the scene node or whatever container you have all of your AI in. And that should be pretty much it. We can go ahead and save and build that. If we go over to our ragdoll, we can add that to the cultist up at the top. Now here on the cultist corpse dissolve function, we are going to go ahead and add in our dissolve meshes. So we'll just add in those two for the eyes and the body mesh. And then we're going to add in the particles pack scene as well as five spawn points. And we're going to be using the spawn 003. So that'll be the center of mass as well as the thigh left, the thigh right, the upper arm left, the upper arm right. Now you can change these to whatever you want. If you can add more or less, if you want, remember, if you add more, you will have more particles and thus more performance costs. But for my purposes, five was enough and it didn't hit performance too bad at all. So let's go ahead and save that and hit play and see how it looks. And if we go ahead and look, we've got our cultists here. And if we go ahead and shoot him in the back, he'll fall over and then he begins to dissolve and the particles just evaporate. And that looks pretty good. So we're going to leave that there for now. Thank you all for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful year and I hope you all are working hard on your own projects and getting a lot done. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you all back here next week for the next tutorial.